Right, so in the last video we introduced uh, the Wasserstein distance on probability measures and we discussed some of its properties and in this video we are going to prove what is perhaps the most famous result about it, uh, the so-called Kantarovich-Rubinstein duality theorem. And first I recall here that the, this Wasserstein distance was defined on not on all probability measures but on this subset which we denoted P1 of S. It's the probability measure such that the distance function from any fixed point X0 is integrable. Okay, and then given two probability measures in this subset of probability measures P1, we define this Wasserstein distance between them denoted W as the infimum of the integral of the distance uh, with respect to the measure mu, where the infimum is taken over all measures on the product space S times S with prescribed marginals uh, P and Q. Okay? And maybe to motivate this kantarovich rubinstein theorem, first let us recall a simple calculation that we have seen last time when we compared the bounded Lipschitz metric with this uh, Wasserstein distance W. Okay, and in that calculation, actually, we never used that the function is bounded. So it was enough to consider a Lipschitz function f with, let's say, a Lipschitz constant bounded by 1. And let's consider any measure mu with marginals p and q. And then what we noticed is that using the Lipschitz Condition, you can write that f of x minus f of y is bounded by the distance between x and y. Okay. And then if you integrate both sides with respect to mu, on the left-hand side, you're actually going to get integral of f with respect to p minus integral of f with respect to q. And on the right-hand side, you get just the integral of d with respect to mu. Okay, and of course that's because on the left hand side the marginals of mu were exactly p and q. Okay, and this inequality holds for all choices of functions f and measure mu as above. Okay, so in particular if on the left hand side we take a supremum over all such functions and on the right hand side we get the infimum over all such measures Okay, we get the inequality um, that that we want. So on the right hand side we get exactly W and on the left hand side last time we used that the supremum is bigger than the supremum over fu functions with the bound which are also bounded whose bounded Lipschitz norm is less than or equal than one. Okay, but here we notice that actually we didn't uh, have to make that jump and we could simply define this left hand side um, as another quantity okay and so that's what we are going to do right now let's give this some name so the definition of this quantity which we are going to call gamma of p and q will be exactly this supremum on uh, the right hand on the left hand side and of course for every f we can also take minus f so i'm going to put the absolute value here we take a supremum over all functions with the Lipschitz constant bounded by 1. And this is very similar to the definition of beta uh, bounded Lipschitz metric. Okay, And of course it dominates beta. So clearly beta is less than or equal than gamma. In particular this implies that gamma is a metric on this set of probability measures P1. Okay, because it's obvious that it satisfies triangle inequality and it's symmetric in P and Q. And if gamma is zero, then beta is also zero, so P must be equal to Q. Okay, so both uh, Wasserstein distance is a metric, and now we introduce this quantity in between beta and w, which is also a metric on this set. Okay. 
And of course, again, we limit ourselves to this set because the function f, if it's just Lipschitz and not bounded, it can grow linearly with distance. So for these integrals to be defined, we have to limit ourselves to this set p1. And then the main result that we are going to prove here is this kantarovich rubinstein theorem, okay, which says that actually gamma and w are equal when we are on a separable metric space. But in any case, here from the beginning, we limit ourselves to, to a metric, separable metric space. So if SD is separable, then Wasserstein distance between P and Q is actually equal to this gamma metric okay, for all P and Q in this collection P1 of S. Okay, so that's the main result that uh, we want to discuss here. And we already proved uh, this one inequality, so we just want to prove inequality in the other direction. Now, let's, ma let's make um, a quick observation here, which is maybe not completely obvious, but it's, uh, it's actually quite simple, is that it's enough to prove this theorem in the case when the metric space is compact. And the reason for this is, is the following lemma, which states that when our metric space is separable, if you consider uh, a probability measure P in this collection P1, so that the distance is integrable, okay, then you can approximate it by probability measures on on finite sets, concentrated on finite sets with respect to the uh, metrics in you know, Wasserstein distance and as a result also with respect to gamma. So in other words, for any epsilon you can find a finite set and a probability measure P prime um, concentrating on this finite set so such that P prime of this finite set is 1 and such that W between P and P prime is less than or equal to an epsilon. Okay. As a result, since W is, is greater than gamma, you also get that gamma is between P and P prime is less than or equal to an epsilon. Okay, and the reason why this uh, simple lemma here allows us to restrict ourselves to compact in the statement of this kantarovich rubinstein theorem is because finite sets are compact, right? So on a finite set F, if we can show that W is equal to gamma, then we simply approximate our probability measures on a separable metric space by a probability measures on finite sets, right? And because, you know, we already said that W and gamma are metrics, this implies that um, this approximation by measures on compacts will also transfer the equality of W to gamma to, you know, general measures on, on our metric space from the compact. Okay, so this particular observation here is pretty straightforward, so I'm just going to give a quick outline how you can see this approximation. Okay, what you do is you, you just take the usual partition of the probability space into um, small pieces. Because S is separable, we can take a disjoint partition ensuring that the diameter of each partition is small, let's say less than epsilon over 2. And then what we can do is we can just take a point xi inside each partition and then define the probability measure to be concentrated on finitely many of these points xi. So first of all we can assign entire probability of the element of the partition to one point for i, let's say, from 2 to n, for some large n. 
And the reason I start from 2 is because I just want to reserve x1 as a special auxiliary point where we assign probability x1 the remaining weight. So 1 minus the sum from, one, from 2 to n of these probabilities above. Okay. And then one can easily check here, which I'm going to skip, but one can easily check that for large enough n, so if you choose this n large enough, you can make sure that the uh, Wasserstein distance between p and p prime will be, will be small. Right? And the reason for this is because, you know, when you look at the integral of the distance, projecting the weight to a point inside the partition, the distance is only um, it only changes you know, by epsilon over 2. And at the same time, we have the assumption that the distance is an integrable function. So the tail of the integral of the distance will be as small as you like when you, you know, eliminate a large enough part of the space. So that's why you can choose this n large enough that the part of the integral will be as small as you like in the tail and so you will have this approximation but you know for details I'll, I'll um, refer to the notes okay all right and so our goal is now to prove the kantarovich rubinstein theorem on a compact space okay and the proof actually passes through another quantity here so we are going to define yet another quantity which we will call uh, m d d m q which is kind of similar to this um, quantity gamma only now we'll, we'll instead of taking a difference we'll take integral of f dp plus integral of g dq and the supremum will be taken over all functions f and g, which are continuous functions on our space, okay, and which will satisfy the following inequality, that f of x plus g of y will be strictly less than the distance between x and y. Now, it, it turns out that actually this is still the same quantity gamma. So there is this simple lemma again, which says that when our metric space is separable, which we assume always here, that this new definition actually coincides with the old definition of gamma above. Okay. Okay, so again, this is an elementary calculation, so I, I will leave it to the notes, but let me just emphasize here that it is used in an essential way in this proof that d is a distance, so d satisfied, satisfies triangle inequality. Okay, and the reason I want to emphasize this will become clear because actually when we are going to prove the kantarovich rubinstein theorem, we are going to compare um, w with md instead of gamma. And that part of the proof will not use that d is a metric. And as a result, it will allow us to extend the, the statement of the theorem to a more general situations. But when we want to compare w with gamma, we have to uh, restrict ourselves to the case when the d is a metric because we are using this particular lemma here. Okay, And so now we have to prove kantarovich rubinstein theorem on a compact space in the sense that we want to show that uh, w is equal to md. All right, and the proof of this will be based on a beautiful application of Hahn-Banach theorem. Okay, and there are many different formulations of this theorem. So in this particular case, we will need the following form of Hahn-Banach theorem. 
In this theorem, we consider some normed vector space. So we have a V, a normed vector space. And then we consider some linear subspace, E. And we also have an open convex set in V. So U will be an open convex set. Such that its intersection with the linear subspace E is not empty. Okay, and then we also consider some linear functional on the subspace. So if R is some real valued linear functional, uh, which is non trivial, so non zero linear functional, then the theorem says that we can extend it to the entire space without increasing the supremum over this convex set or the you know its intersection with the linear subspace so then there exists a linear functional on the whole space such that this is an extension of r so if you restrict this to to the subspace you get back your r and moreover, the supremum over U of this extension is equal to the supremum over U intersected with E of R. In the notes, we give um, a proof of this statement by reducing it to maybe a, a, um, a version of Han Banach theorem, which is more well known in the form of separation of two convex sets when one of them is an open convex set. Okay, but right now I'm just going to show how you can apply this um, extension of this linear functional theorem to, to prove the kantarovich rubinstein theorem in, in, the, in this form that we wrote on, on a compact space. Okay, so basically we have to just find the right uh, normed space, subspace, and the set, and the functional, so that um, the statement of this theorem will really become exactly what we want. Okay. And the choice of all these spaces and sets will be as follows. Okay. The space will be a space of continuous functions on the product space with L infinity norm. Okay. Then let me first define this open set. Okay, it will be a set of all functions in V which are bounded by the distance function, so which are strictly less than dxy. Okay, clearly this is a convex set. And moreover, it's an open set. And the reason it is open is because we have this strict inequality here. And the distance function as a continuous function on, on a compact achieves its infimum, so achieves its minimum. And as a result, there will be some epsilon gap between these two functions. Okay, So as a result, this set will be an open set in this space with L infinity norm. Now let me point out here that if our function d was for example a lower semi-continuous function th then you would still have the set u convex and open set. So the reason I emphasize this here is because we'll see that nowhere in this proof we will use that D is a metric and that it satisfies triangle inequality. Okay? And the only thing, the only property of D that we will actually use is the one right here, that, that this set um, that we wrote down is an open set. All right, and then what will be the linear subspace? So the linear subspace here will be a subspace of continuous functions on s times s, which can be written in the form f of x plus g of y for some continuous functions f and g 
on our metric space S. Okay, so this will be the definition of our um, linear subspace and the intersection of this linear subspace with the set U above okay, will be just the functions phi of this form f of x plus g of y with this additional constraint that this is strictly less than d of x, y. Okay, in addition to um, okay, the f and g being continuous. Now we can see that this is exactly the set in the definition of um, this quantity md. And so to connect to the definition of md, the linear functional r that we are going to consider on this linear subspace will be just the integral of f dp plus integral of g dq. And so now we have all the objects in Hahn-Banach theorem, so we just have to read off the conclusion. So by Hahn-Banach theorem, we know that we can find some linear functional rho on, the, on this whole space V such that it's an extension of this functional R and such that the supremum over U of this extension is equal to the supremum over U intersected with E of the original functional R. But the supremum on the right hand side here is exactly uh, our definition of md of p and q, right? Because we take the supremum of the sum of these two integrals over f and g so that their sum f of x plus g of y is, is bounded by d. So th th this right hand side is exactly this md between p and q. Okay, and so now we just have to check some properties of this extension and to show that we can apply Reed's representation theorem that in fact this functional row will be a bounded positive functional so it can be written as an integral with respect to some probability measure on the Borel sigma algebra on the product space S times S. Okay. And so what kind of properties we have to check? Well first we have to check that uh, it's a non-negative functional in the sense that if you take some non-negative continuous A, then rho of A will also be non-negative. So let's start with this positivity property. Okay, and the way you can observe this is by noticing that if you take some positive real number or non-negative real number C, then distance function minus C times A minus epsilon will be less than or equal than d x y minus epsilon which is strictly less than d x y. So this linear combination on the left hand side will be in our set u. right? So this, this belongs to the set u. And in particular the functional row applied to this linear combination which of course will be just rho of d minus c rho of a minus rho of epsilon. Right? It will be a value of this functional rho on one of the points in u. And because the supremum of rho over u is equal to uh, md, this, this will also be bounded from above by this md between p and q. But notice that if rho, it would, rho of a would be negative here, then by sending c to plus infinity, you would get a contradiction. Right? So as a result, you, you see that rho of a has to be non-negative for this upper bound uh, to hold. Okay? And this shows the positivity of this functional. All right, of course, the positivity immediately implies monotonicity 
so that if you have two continuous functions phi1 and phi2 and one is bigger than the other then rho phi1 is less than or equal than rho phi2 and that's just bilinearity and the positivity and monotonicity of course uh, now will imply the boundedness of our function because if you take any continuous function in our space v you can just squeeze it in between minus l infinity norm times one and plus l infinity norm times one and then using monotonicity you of course get from here that rho of this will be bounded from above and below so in other words the absolute value will be bounded by l infinity norm of phi times rho of one but of course function one belongs to a subspace right it, it can be viewed for example as a function of x plus zero so function of x plus function of y so since rho is an extension this will be r of one which by definition would be just one and so we see that rho is indeed uh, a bounded functional so as a result we can apply a reed's representation theorem and we can write this functional rho of phi as an integral with respect to some measure okay for some unique measure on the Borel sigma algebra on our space okay and then it just remains to um, see uh, what the above properties tell us about this measure okay so first of all since the restriction of the functional to the subspace is r right that means that the integral of f of x plus g of y so if we consider integral of any function on this linear subspace it would coincide with the original definition and the functional was defined as integral f with respect to p integral g with respect to q so we must have uh, this identity here and of course this implies that measure mu has marginals p and q like we wish Right? because if you just set one of the functions to be zero you get that integral of a function on one coordinate with respect to mu is the same as integral with respect to either p or q so the marginal must be p or q and then finally we can use the fact that the supremum okay which on one side we already saw by definition it was just this quantity md P and Q should coincide with the the other side which was the supremum of our functional rho over this open set U and what is this supremum this supremum is just a supremum so now we know that rho is is the integral with respect to this measure mu and the set U was all continuous functions phi bounded by the distance function here which obviously is just the integral of the distance with respect to mu and so the supremum of the extension is is just this integral in the definition of the um, Wasserstein distance now mu is just one measure with marginals p and q so it's greater or equal than infimum over all such measures and that was the definition of uh, Wasserstein distance between P and Q and so the Hahn-Banach theorem here implies that the W is, is um, bounded from above by this quantity MD P and Q and of course in the other direction well if we for example use the previous lemma and say that md is equal to gamma then we already know the inequality in the other direction but here we also want to notice that we have this inequality 
without the reference to gamma, right? Because we said that this equality between MD and gamma depends on the fact that D is, is a metric and satisfies triangle inequality. But in this particular proof, we do not want to use the triangle inequality. And so instead, you can just repeat the same proof as uh, we did above for showing that gamma is bounded by double, right? You simply take any two functions, f and g, that satisfy the definition in satisfy this property in the definition md and you take any measure mu with marginals p and q now you integrate uh, both sides with respect to mu and on the left hand side you get integral with respect to the integrals with respect to the marginals and on the right hand side you get integral of the distance and as before Taking supremum on the left-hand side and infimum on the right-hand side, you, you get that MD is bounded by W. So the inequality in this direction was just as easy and just as general as in the case of gamma. And we already proved the inequality in the other direction. So this finishes the proof of kantarovich rubinstein theorem for the compact space. That also means that it finishes the proof of the original kantarovich rubinstein theorem that W is equal to gamma on separable spaces. Okay, but let's notice that as we saw the proof here never used the triangle inequality. So for example, one extension that this allows us um, to obtain is to consider some powers of the distances. Of course, there is a more general formulation, but the one that will be needed for our purposes in the next section is the following, that you know, when you have a distance function, you can take some power greater than one of this distant function. And then you can, can, you can think of this as your new function d, except it's not a distance. It does not satisfy a triangle inequality. But nevertheless, if you define gamma and w in the same way, just treating this as a, just as a function d of x, y, then you still have the equality as above. In this case, we actually have to, since we, we are going to, in, we are integrating the distance to the power, we also have to limit ourselves to a set of probability measures on our metric space, such that the distance function from some fixed point x0 to the power p is integrable for the same reason as, as above. And then we can define a version of Wasserstein distance, let's call it wp, in exactly the same way except we, ha we have to take a power 1 over p. So in other words, I'll put a power p on this side and then the definition with the infimum of the integral will be the same as, as before. So now the function d is replaced by d to the power and we minimize this integral over all measures mu with prescribed marginals p and q. And the definition of md is exactly the same as before. So this is a supremum of integral of f plus integral of g over all continuous pairs f and g that satisfy f of x plus g of y is less than d to the power p. So again, just the distance is replaced by a power of the distance. And then we showed above that if our space is compact, then exactly the same proof as before gives us that w p Right, that this infimum and this supremum, they, they coincide. So that WP to the power P is equal to this MD, P and Q. Okay, so you, you have this generalization on compacts for you know, this corresponding modification of, of uh, this W and M. However, the extension to from compact 
space to some more general spaces, it's not as direct. And, you know, it requires some additional assumptions and maybe it requires to take a different approach in the proof. Okay, and the reason for this is that, you know, on one side, this WP, if you forget about this power P, it's still going to be a metric on, um, you know, this set of probability measures such that the distance to the power p is integrable. The proof of this fact that this is still a metric will be essentially the same as before, only instead of using the triangle inequality for the distance, here you can use the triangle inequality for the LP norm, right? If you take um, this, you know, power p in the definition of w and put it to the other side, on the other side you are minimizing the LP norm of the distance. And that still satisfies triangle inequality for P bigger than 1, and the rest of the proof is really identical. And so you can still show that WP is a metric, but we no longer have this metric gamma here, and we don't have this equality between gamma and MD because we are working with the power of the metric, which is itself uh, not a metric, and we essentially used a triangle inequality um, in that lemma that proved that gamma is equal to MD. So, extending this particular statement for the powers or for some more general uh, functions, you know, one has to take uh, a different approach, and so at the end of this section we give a result in a particular case when the metric space is uh, just Euclidean space. So for simplicity, we consider the case of uh, just the Euclidean space with the usual Euclidean metric. And we show how you can extend the statement from compacts to the whole space. So in other words, here we prove that uh, W E on uh, the Euclidean space to the power P will be equal to this quantity MD uh, in this setting, okay? And there are some technicalities of this extension from compacts to the whole space, which can be generalized to more general situations, but for the application in the next section, we it's enough for us to consider the, the case of just the Euclidean space, and also it simplifies some details in the proof. So uh, again, I, I'm going to leave that part to the notes. It gets a little bit lengthy and just um, stop here.